Good morning, everyone. We want to thank you for your presence with us at morning worship on this Sabbath day. Just to read to you from Isaiah 43, the opening verses. We pray there'll be an encouragement to you. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord, thy God, the Holy One of Israel, uh, thy Saviour. So we pray the Lord will bless and encourage every heart uh, through those great promises of the Lord's presence and his preserving hand upon us. There are many references to the Trinity in the book of Isaiah. And we have one there just in the third verse, the final words that we read, For I am the Lord thy God. That's a reference to the Father, the Holy One of Israel, is the Spirit, and then thy Saviour, uh, the Lord Jesus uh, himself. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is with us. And we rejoice in that knowledge today. The hymn 78, please. O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep the silent stars go by. So the hymn 78 will stand as we worship, please.
Let's just pray together. We'll seek the Lord. Our Father, we rejoice as we approach Thee in the truth of Your Word that Your mercy endureth forever. We rejoice in that knowledge today, Father. We pray that You'll help us to appreciate it, to understand it as never before. We want to thank you for your mercy to us this day. We can say with the prophet that your mercies are new every morning, and great is thy faithfulness. Thank you, Father, for being merciful to us again this day, even enabling us to have the health and strength to be here in the house of God. And we want to thank you most of all for your mercy to us in Christ, that you are pleased to reach down and uh, to save us from our sins. We thank you, Father, for the knowledge uh, the day that we have been forgiven, that our sins are pardoned. Who is a pardoning God like thee? Or who is grace so rich and free? And we rejoice, Father, that uh, what you've done in our hearts and our lives, you're able to do for others also. And Lord, our prayer is that there'll be some in both of these meetings this very day that will uh, come to Jesus Christ uh, in salvation. We pray you'll pour out the Spirit upon us in all his fullness. Lord, we come in our emptiness. We come in our weakness. We confess that freely. We need the power of God. We need the touch of the Lord to be upon our lives and upon our service, upon all that we do for Christ. We need the touch of God today upon these meetings. We ask, Father, that you'll come and quicken us in our walk with God and quicken us in our service. We pray the prayer of the psalmist, quicken thou me according to thy word. And even, Father, through the preaching of the word of God today, may our hearts be challenged. May it please thee to bring us on a little further uh, with thyself. Thank you for the children, the young people that are gathered in the house of God today. We thank you for their presence in Sunday school and Bible class. We thank you for all that they've been taught of the scriptures through this year, Father. Our burden and prayer is that uh, all the children of this congregation will know the Savior. Pray they'll all be born again of the Spirit. Pray they'll all be saved uh, early in life. Pray, Father, that every family uh, in this church would know a household salvation. Father, we've thought of your mercy and what a mercy that is, just to know that all the family are saved and safe uh, for all of God's great eternity. We ask thee, Father, even at this Christmas time to speak to hearts. We pray that there'll be some uh, long prayed for, even in this congregation and among the families of the church. There'll be some that will experience that gift of God eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lord, we want to pray that some in our meetings today will be like the wise men. They'll go home another way. They'll go home those who have been changed and transformed, those who have been made new creatures, even in Christ Jesus. We want to pray, Father, bless our fellowship uh, together. Pray you'll make us a blessing uh, to each other. We, We want to pray, Father, help us to Fulfill the scriptures when it it teaches us to exhort one another. And so much the more as we see that day approaching. And Lord, we're conscious that the day of his return uh, is drawing nigh. The days are darkening. And there's a great need for us, Father, to encourage each other in the things of, of the Lord. Bless this church. We want to thank you for your preserving hand upon this testimony uh, throughout this year. We acknowledge your mercy in providing for us, supplying our every need. We want to thank you, Father, for every opportunity granted in the spread of the gospel. We pray that more such opportunities, even greater uh, doors of opportunity and utterance, will be given to us as a church in the year that in your will we'll soon enter out into. Lord, lead this work on. We pray that the congregation uh, will go forward. We're praying for the strengthening of the work. We're asking thee to to add to it. You're the one that gives 
that increase. So we plead, plead, Father, that you might hear our earnest cries uh, even to that end. We ask you to remember those that uh, can't be here today because of uh, age or infirmity, uh, those that are unwell. We're asking, Father, that you might be near to them especially, uh, draw near. Remember that lovely name, Emmanuel, God with us. May that be true of all of our families, but especially, Father, uh, those that uh, can't be out for fellowship in the house of God. May they especially, particularly today, know that the Lord uh, is with them. Draw near and comfort their hearts. We pray for the healing hand of God uh, to rest upon each one uh, just at this time. And Lord, help us uh, to appreciate the health that you give to us. How often we take for granted those blessings that you bestow upon us. And Lord, we want to pray that you'll help us to give ourselves in the service of Christ while there's time and while there is uh, that opportunity. We remember, Father, the angels announced that there would be peace on earth. And Lord, we pray for that day. We pray for the coming again of the one who is the Prince of Peace. As we think at this season of his first advent, we would pray in fulfillment and obedience to the teaching of your word. We pray for the coming again for the second advent. Our cry is, even so come, uh, Lord Jesus. We long for that day when they will beat their, their swords into plowsh plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks, that nations shall not lift up sword against nation, and neither shall they learn war any more. Remember, Father, those conflicts taking place on the earth, in Ukraine and in Israel at this time. Pray for the hand of God to intervene. We pray, Father, that very soon, very quickly, that those conflicts would be uh, brought to a, clo a close and a conclusion. We're praying, Father, for wisdom uh, to be given uh, to those in places of authority. Uh, even at this time, you've exhorted us so to pray that we might le lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. Lord, hear our prayers. We commit our way to thee today, asking you'll come and uh, guide us through this meeting now. We do pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 118, we're going to further sing together. This was Martin Luther's uh, favorite psalm. Remember, it contains in the middle verse of the Bible, Psalm 118, verse 8. Uh, we're going to sing through that section. We're singing the opening nine verses. It's six verses in all that we will We'll sing just because of the formation uh, of the verses. Uh, oh, praise the Lord, for he is good. His mercy lasteth ever. Let those who are of Israel say, his mercy faileth uh, never. We're going to sing it to the tune of uh, While Shepherds Watch Their Flocks uh, by Night. So in keeping with the season too. So hunt the Psalm 118, the first nine verses, please.
scripture reading this Sabbath morning is taken from 1 Peter chapter 1. So Peter's first epistle. The first chapter. We're going to read the first 12 verses of the portion together. So let us hear the word of the Lord. 1 Peter 1, verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honour and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, ye love, and whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. So closing a reading there, the end of that 12th verse, and we're sure the Lord will add his blessing uh, today to the public reading of his word. We take a moment to welcome you all in the name of the Lord Jesus uh, to the Lord's house uh, this Sabbath morning. May we know the Lord's presence. May we know the truth of that name. Uh, as we prayed a little earlier, Emmanuel, may God be with us. May he be with us today. May he be with us this week. May you know his presence with you right over uh, this holiday period, even into uh, the new year of 2024. If you're visiting with us, we want to thank you for coming to the service. Uh, we're encouraged to have you present today, and it's our prayer that you'll be blessed uh, by the fellowship and the ministry of, of the Lord's Word here today. It's good to have all the children and young people that are present in the service. Uh, we were blessed to hear you uh, practicing here for the carol service in the church uh, just a little earlier. We're looking forward to the carol service, and I'm thankful to you for the chair that you left me here in the pulpit 
uh, you must have thought I needed a little bit of elevation just that you could, you could see me that wee bit better. But we are looking forward to the, to the carol service uh, next uh, Sabbath evening. And we do welcome all that are watching on the live stream. Uh, we're thankful to you for joining the service. And we pray that the word of the Lord especially will be of help and encouragement uh, to your hearts today. We take a moment too to thank uh, all the ladies that attended the Christmas evening. Uh, it was very well supported. It was a great night of fellowship. Uh, especially we want to thank our sister Sarah and those that helped her uh, for the excellent meal that was served. Uh, it was evident to all that were present there was so much thought and planning and work that had gone into all of the preparations and uh, the meal was uh, thoroughly enjoyed by all that were present. And also to those that helped with the decorations, uh, they really added uh, to the evening. So all in all, it was uh, a very memorable uh, night. And uh, on behalf of the ladies, we want to thank the committee uh, for covering the costs of the food. The ladies uh, would like the committee to know that that was very much appreciated and, and a great encouragement uh, to them at the end of this, this year. We also want to thank those that helped with uh, the Sunday School Party uh, last uh, Saturday evening. There was a lot of work, a lot of preparation that was made uh, for it also uh, by quite a number of people. Uh, the games were great. There was lots of new ideas. It was great to see the children participating in the games uh, so enthusiastically and uh, enjoying themselves uh, at the party. There was a great supper that was served uh, by uh, the Sunday school teachers and the Christmas gifts that were given out uh, as well. Uh, I think we enjoyed the three Fs. It would, it would sum it up well, the fun, the food, and the fellowship. So I want to thank everybody uh, for their support and their help in both of those uh, very special evenings, those special functions uh, of the church uh, just at this season of the year. Please remember the prayer meeting tonight, uh, 6 o'clock. We encourage you to come along. 6.30 is the gospel service. It will be the carols and scripture readings uh, with the young people uh, taking part. We always appreciate the participation of uh, the youth fellowship. Uh, we do look forward to that as well. We want to encourage them. So we encourage you to come along uh, and encourage the young people tonight uh, just with your presence in uh, that service. And then the theme, the brief message uh, that we will bring at the end of the service in the gospel uh, will be peace at, at Christmas. So I urge you to come and uh, invite others to be present uh, as well. Remember the meetings through the week, 10 o'clock uh, tomorrow morning is the parent and toddler group. Uh, it is the last parent and toddler group of uh, this year. Uh, so we do want to thank Laura and the team of ladies that assist her uh, for all of their labours uh, during this year. It's very encouraging uh, to see all that attend the parent and toddler group, uh, all that hear the word of God uh, through that outreach of the church. And it's our prayer that it will go on uh, from strength to strength in the new year uh, of 2024. Remember Wednesday night at 8 o'clock, the midweek service, our prayer meeting and Bible study. Uh, we invite you to come along. We know it's a busy week. We would appreciate uh, your presence. In the will of the Lord, I'll be uh, preaching at that service myself. Uh, then next uh, Lord's Day, uh, the 24th of uh, December, uh, Christmas Eve, the Sunday, school at, uh, the Sunday School and Bible classes at 10.40. Uh, 11.30 a.m. is uh, the morning service. Uh, 6.30 p.m. is uh, the evening service. Uh, that will take the form of our annual Christmas carol uh, service. I'll be preaching at the morning meeting. Uh, we've invited Miss Doreen McAfee uh, to come along and speak at uh, the carol service. You know that her sister's home uh, visiting with uh, her family, especially uh, over this holiday period. Uh, so we're pleased that she's able uh, to join with us uh, at the carol service that will be very special uh, for us so keep that in mind and there will be supper for everyone uh, after the carol service next uh, sabbath evening uh, so we ask the ladies as you're able 
uh, to help just with the food uh, for the supper. And please remember uh, the half hour of prayer before uh, both services. The senior citizens' gifts uh, are in the porch. If you haven't received yours as yet, please uh, take it as you're leaving uh, the service. The men will be able to, to help you locate yours on the tables. And if you can, take the gift uh, for your family members and your neighbours. Uh, that would be a, a great help to us. Uh, we want to express our sincere thanks to uh, Wesley and Laura uh, for all the time and work that they put into preparing uh, both the list and the gifts for us uh, each year. Uh, they do a great job, and uh, we want them to know as well that that is very much uh, appreciated. Remember the free will offering envelopes for uh, 2024. Uh, if you haven't received yours as yet, see our brother, Mr. Billy Hill. And remember, we encourage you to, to sign up uh, for the free will offering envelope scheme uh, to support the church uh, here weekly uh, with your finance. If you haven't already done that, uh, speak to our brother, Mr. Billy Hill, and he'll be able to make the necessary uh, arrangements for you. Keep in mind the literature uh, that's there. Uh, it's a good time for the calendars, good time of the year. So the Missionary Council prayer calendar, uh, the Let the Bible Speak uh, annual calendar that they bring out, uh, it's priced four pounds. And there's some copies of the Way of Life a calendar you may like to take and give out with gifts uh, over the Christmas time. It's a good means of uh, evangelism as well. Remember the quarterly magazine uh, of the Let the Bible Speak. Uh, some copies there and the flyers as well for the International Congress uh, of the Free Presbyterian Church that's going to be held uh, in Martyrs next July, the 1st to the 5th uh, of July uh, next summer. Dr. Douglas's book, uh, The Land and the Book, copies available at that new launch introductory price of uh, five pounds. Uh, it would make a good gift for a friend or family member uh, at this Christmas time. Uh, if there's need of more copies, let us, let us know about that. Remember the Christmas missionary offering uh, this year is going to be for the Bible Spreading Union in England uh, to help them uh, purchase Bibles. Uh, they give grants uh, to different churches and missionary organizations. They buy the Bibles from the Trinitarian uh, Bible Society and help those uh, that want to distribute uh, the Word of God. Uh, they have given us grants here in the past. We've appreciated that. Uh, so we'd like to help them in that very important work in which they're engaged. We'll take that Christmas missionary offering next Lord's Day. So if you'd like to give to it, and we encourage you to give generously, uh, mark the envelope, please, for uh, the Bible Spreading uh, Union. This Wednesday morning, uh, our two brethren, Mr. Colin Maxwell and Mr. Noel Shields, uh, are going to be in Armagh. Remember, in recent years, they have been conducting open airs and outreaches in a number of the towns and cities across the province, particularly in the winter time, when they aren't just as busy uh, with the missions and uh, with the children's work in which they're involved. So they will be in Armagh this coming uh, Wednesday morning uh, to do an open air and some outreach. Uh, so please pray for them. And if you see them, if you're down the town, uh, take the time to speak to them and encourage them. Uh, in the work in which they're involved. Remember those that are in hospital, our sister, Mrs. Florence Redmond, she would really appreciate the prayers of the congregation uh, just for the Lord's healing touch uh, to be upon her. And Stephanie's mother, uh, Mrs. Telford, is also in hospital with uh, pneumonia. And uh, the family would appreciate your prayers uh, for Mrs. Telford too, just for a, for a speedy recovery uh, at this time. The hymn 445, please, I think those are, are all the announcements. 445, it's not an easy road, we're traveling to heaven. For many are the thorns on the way, it's not an easy road, but the Savior is with us. His presence gives us joy uh, every day. Verses 1 and 3 of 445 will stand as we sing, please.
Let's just bow together again in prayer, please. Yeah. Father, we ask thee to guide us in our petitions. May we know the leading of the Spirit. I want to thank you for the outreach that will be carried out in this city during the week. Remember Brother Mr. Maxwell or Brother Mr. Shields. We thank thee for their faithfulness in the work of the gospel, not just through this year, but over many years. Lord, give them encouragement in their work. Give them opportunities even to speak to needy souls in the city on Wednesday morning. May the hand of God be upon their labors. We want to pray, Father, for those that are unwell at this time. Pray for the the healing and strengthening touch of the Lord uh, to be upon our sister Florence. May she be conscious of your presence. We're mindful of Ella Rose as well. Praying, Father, for your good hand in a very definite way uh, to be upon our young sister. Mindful of Tracy also. Pray that you might be near to her. Remember John and Helen, support them through these very difficult days. And we're mindful, uh, too, of Mrs. Telford. Ask that you might be near to her also in the hospital bed. And Lord, we pray that uh, it'll be pleased thee to grant our sister a healing touch uh, from thyself at this time as well. We commit these and all that are experiencing infirmity uh, just into your hands. We're glad, Father, we're able to pray about everything. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. And Lord, we bring our time now around the word before thee. Let this be a profitable time. May the Lord draw near. We pray that our hearts will burn within us. We pray for the speaking voice of God. And we ask thee, Lord, to give us just that word that is needed, a word from your mouth, a word to him uh, that is weary. And so these are prayers, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. First Timothy 1, please. And the verses 6 and 7 are our text today. First Timothy 1, 6 and 7. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honour and glory at the appearing of uh, Jesus Christ. I want to think this morning on the subject of the trials and troubles of life, and especially the trials and troubles of uh, the Christian life. And that hymn that we just sang together, uh, there's a line that says, there are trials and troubles. And every one of us that are here this morning know how true that is. And we know it is true, uh, particularly by experience. Uh, all of us have passed through those times of trials uh, and troubles. And that, brethren and sisters, is what Peter is teaching about here. He's talking in this passage about the trials of the Christian life. Can I point out to you for uh, your help as you read and study this epistle that that is one of the main themes of this letter, uh, the theme of suffering, the theme of trial. The key word of uh, 1 Peter is the word suffering or or, uh, words that are equivalent to it. The word itself or similar words are found no less than 21 times in this uh, short letter. So it's very clear if you think of 21 spread over just five chapters, it's evident that this is a clear theme of uh, the book. So the subject is addressed fully and thoroughly in the five chapters of the epistle. This is a key book in the Bible uh, to help us to understand uh, suffering in uh, the Christian life. In that regard, it's interesting to note that the sufferings of Christ are spoken of in every chapter uh, of this 
epistle, but those sufferings, the sufferings of our Savior, are never mentioned in uh, the second epistle. So there's no doubt in this letter we learn something about uh, suffering. Peter was writing to a people who were suffering, a people who were being tried. And he's writing to strengthen and encourage uh, these believers. Uh, this book, this letter, has much to say. It has much to teach those believers who are being uh, tried. So if that is your condition today, if you're suffering, if you're being persecuted, if you're being tried or in a time of trouble, then there's a message here uh, for you today. So let me just highlight uh, some of the lessons that you learn about trials and troubles, the trials and troubles of the Christian life. You'll notice, uh, first of all, that those trials are to be expected. Notice that the text says in verse 7, the trial of your faith. So it's clear from this text, clear from this epistle, the times of trial will come to the child of God. There's something that is to be expected. Life for the Christian in this world will not be easy. We've been singing together about that already. There will be periods of great difficulty, even periods of great darkness in the Christian life. There are some Christians, mainly in Pentecostal circles, who would teach that a person who is saved will never again face trial and affliction. But let me emphasize uh, to your brethren and sisters that nothing could be further from the truth. That is not what Peter is teaching in this epistle. It's not what he taught in either of his epistles. And that is not scriptural. So it's not a scriptural view of the Christian life. And it's not the message of the Word of God. Many times over, the Bible leaves us in no doubt that the Christian path will not be easy. Peter said, if you look a little further into the epistle, chapter 4, verse 12, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. Those Christians I've mentioned to you already that would say that Christians should never again experience trouble, they would want you to think it's a strange thing if trial enters into your life, times of trouble. But Peter says that's not the case. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, uh, which is to try you. So his message is, you're not to think of trial being a strange thing. It's not uncommon. It's not something that's out of the ordinary for the child of God. Even fiery trial or severe trial is the idea there. It's not to be seen as a strange event for you. It's not to be seen as a strange situation in which you find yourself. Remember the Savior said himself in John's epistle, in the world ye shall have tribulation. Can I ask you to note the certainty? He's saying ye shall have. In other words, as long as you're in this world, as long as you're present here in this life, there will be periods of tribulation. There will be times uh, of trouble. Paul said to the Thessalonian believers that no man should be moved by these afflictions. For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. So don't be moved, don't be troubled uh, by afflictions. They are an appointed part of the Christian life. Do you see the word uh, where it says we are appointed? Just as certain as an appointment that you have in this life, we are appointed uh, thereon too. Paul said to Timothy, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Notice again the sureness of the suffering for the Christian. And he, he says that those sufferings are sure, that they shall suffer a persecution. And those sufferings are sure not for the carnal Christian, uh, but for the godly Christian, the one that's walking for the Lord, because he says, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer a persecution. 
And then we go a step further and ask you to notice that you will be tried personally. You will be tried individually. Because the text says the trial of your faith. It's interesting to to think and to study of being tried by God. But it's, it's not easy. It's not pleasant to consider your trial. It's easier to think of somebody else's trials and troubles. But I want you to notice, brethren and sisters, you'll be tried personally uh, by the Lord. The reality is that none of us will be excluded. It won't be some or most or other Christians who are tested. You will be tested also. Remember that Paul said, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So it's clear that none uh, will be excluded. As St. Augustine, the church father, so clearly and powerfully stated, God has one son without sin, but he never had a son without trial. Never had a son uh, without trial. So it's clear that trials are to be expected uh, by the Christian. No true child of God will be exempt from trials in this life. So I urge you today, don't be worried. Don't be discouraged if you're being tried. It is to be the common lot of God's people. And remember that trials are a mark that you are a true Christian. Paul stated when he was writing to the Hebrew believers, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. So those trials are a a sure mark that you really are a child of God. So trials, brethren and sisters, are to be expected. Something else to emphasize that Peter teaches, the trials are essential. You look at the words in verse 6, if need be. Literally, those words mean there is need. So here's something that you may not have considered before, or you you may not like to face up to. But he's teaching us that experiencing trials and tests is something that is needed for the Christian. It's something that's absolutely essential. It's something that's a vital, a very important part uh, of the Christian life. It's something that's very important for for the growth and grace of the child of God. You ask, why is trials and troubles needed? Well, one answer is so that your life can be purified. If you look at verse 7, the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire. The picture Peter's presenting us here with is of gold going into the furnace. And that is how it is purged and purified. And it is the same in the Christian life. Remember that the Lord said, Uh, to Israel through Isaiah the prophet and I will turn my hand upon thee and purely purge away thy dross and take away all thy tin so whenever a Christian goes through the fires of affliction the result is the dross that which is of no value of no use the dross in your life is burnt up all the pride all the self reliance those things are purged away. Sometimes a Christian, maybe this is true of you, they think that they're strong. They imagine that they're spiritual. They think they're strong in the faith, when in reality they can be puffed up, full of pride, full of self-reliance. You think of the night the Lord Jesus was betrayed, and Peter, the man who wrote this epistle, full of himself, thinking that he was better than everybody else. He thought he was better, stronger, more spiritual than all the other apostles. He boastfully declared, though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. He also said, though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Peter thought he could face every circumstance. But when the test came, what happened? He failed the test, and he failed it woefully. And the reason he failed was because 
he was touching, uh, trusting too much in himself, too much in uh, the flesh. So, brethren and sisters, here's why trials are needful, why they're essential. They let us see where we really are in the Christian life. They let us see where we really stand before the Lord. They help us to grow. They help us to develop. They help us to mature in uh, the things of God. David stated, it is good for me. Notice the words carefully. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. So David had been in the school of affliction, and he said it was good. We don't always think like that. We don't always feel like that. But he said it, it was good. It was something that was helpful, something that was profitable. And he learned great lessons there. And he learned great lessons in the school of affliction from the Bible, from the Word of God. And the fact, brethren and sisters, is there are lessons in the Christian life that you can't learn anywhere else except through those times of trial and through those times of trouble. Stephen Charnock was one of the great Puritan preachers. He said, we often learn more of God under the rod that strikes us than under the staff uh, that comforts us. And how true that is. How important to see and to learn that uh, that is really what Peter is saying to us here, what he's teaching us, brethren and sisters. There is a need. Uh, there is a need for trial uh, in the Christian life. So those trials are essential. The third thing we'll emphasize is that the trials are extreme. The trials that God has appointed for his people Often they're not simple, they're not easy. There's times that they can be very severe, very difficult, even very painful to bear. We're taught that here in this passage in two ways. We're taught it by the nature of the trial. In the middle of verse 7 it says, Though it be tried with fire. He's teaching that just as gold goes through the fire, uh, so too will the Christian. We read those words of Isaiah at the beginning of the meeting. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou passest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. So just as the gold goes through the fire, sometimes we go through the fire too, the fires of affliction. Peter, in that verse we highlighted a little earlier, chapter 4, verse 12, he speaks of the fiery trial, which is uh, to try you. Isaiah said as well, he spoke of uh, the furnace of affliction. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. So the message is clear. It's unmistakable, brethren and sisters. There are times that the trials a believer will face will be severe. They will be the most searching, the most bitter trials that it's possible for any person to experience here in this world and in this life. It'll be no child's thing, no child's play. Mr. Spurgeon said that the blows of the flail of tribulation are not given in sport, but they're given in awful earnest. And some of the blows of life that you will experience, even as a child of God, will be very strong, very hard and sometimes very painful to bear. So we see that the extremity of the trials of the Christian life are taught by the nature of the trials, but also by the number of the trials. At the end of verse 6, Peter says, Ye are in manifold temptation. Remember the word temptation has, has two meanings in the Scriptures. The idea there is manifold trials or manifold troubles. In other words, many. That's the idea of the word manifold. So he's teaching that, that the trials of the Christian, they're not going to be few or scarce in number. They're, they're going to be something that will be many. You can expect, as you walk the pilgrim pathway, to be tried over and over and over again. 
the psalmist said, many are the, the afflictions of the righteous. Paul, writing to Timothy of his own experience, said, persecutions, afflictions, which came on to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. And notice, it's easy to pass over it in the reading uh, of the passage, but both persecutions and afflictions are in the plural. Paul says persecutions, afflictions. So Paul's trials had been many. They had been manifold. And he had many trials in a short time. That was just one short section of one of his missionary journeys that he was speaking about. Remember that Job, that choice servant of the Lord, man that feared God, eschewed evil, he lost his wealth, lost his business, lost his family, lost his health. And he lost all of those things, not at different times in his life, but all at one time. His trials were many, and his trials were extreme. There's an old saying, I'm sure you've used it yourself, trouble never comes on its own. So brethren and sisters, you can expect to be tested, and you can expect to be tested many times. And then those many trials, you will be tested in various ways. You'll be tested by poverty, by illness and infirmity, by difficult circumstances, by persecutions of those who oppose you as a, as a Christian. You'll be tested by bereavement and by the loss of loved ones, those who are near and dear to us. The trials will be severe. The trials will be extreme. You ask today, how will I get through the trials? How will I endure the furnace? How will I cope with those extreme and difficult times? Well, the answer is by his strength, by his power, and by his grace. Remember, it's good to read uh, the verses in their context. Look at verse 5, just uh, the verse before where we took our text from today. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So just think of those words, kept by the power of God. How vital that is, brethren and sisters. What you must do is pray. Pray earnestly for his power, for his grace. Pray for the Lord to strengthen you. Pray for a, a nearer sense of his presence. Pray for his guidance as you make all the very difficult decisions in those times of trouble. Notice as well the encouraging words there at the end of verse 2. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. You ever notice that before? That the grace that you need, the peace amidst all the times of anxiety, that those great graces can be multiplied. God can give them to you in abundance. And that's what Peter uh, was praying for these Christians. And brethren and sisters, I encourage you to pray for others, bear one another's burdens. What a great help and support that can be. Those that you know who are passing through times of trial and trouble, pray that grace and peace might be multiplied uh, unto them. The final thing we'll emphasize is the end of the trials and troubles. What, what end or what outcome, what result has God in view by times of trouble? We'll look at verse 7. He speaks of the trial of your faith. And the end of the verse says that it might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. The purpose or the end that God has in view by trial and suffering is especially to test your faith. And there are two reasons in particular that the Lord tests your faith. One is to prove the sincerity of your faith in Christ. Remember that you can't be sure that your faith is a true faith until it has been tested and until it has been tried. Remember that 
often people make what we call a profession of faith. But in many instances, there is no possession. There's no reality in what actually took place. Whenever the Savior was explaining the parable of the sower, this is what he taught about the seed on the stony ground. And have no root in themselves, so endure, but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. So the message is, when afflictions and persecutions came to such people, it was evident there was no root. In other words, there was no reality, there was no sincerity. They were people who were never saved. The hymn writer said, If all were easy, if all were bright, where would the cross be and where would the fight? But in the hardness God gives to you chances of proving that you are true. So God is proving you and he's proving the sincerity of your faith. Uh, by the trials that you're passing through. The other reason that the Lord has for trials is to prove the strength of your faith, not just the sincerity of it, but the strength of it. There are times you mistakenly think that your faith is strong when in reality is weak. But how are, how are you to know how strong your faith is unless it is tested? To know the strength of any item, like a rope or a chain or metal, it has to be tested. And often it is tested over and over. And your life, your Christian life, your faith in Christ is the same. It needs testing over and over to see the strength of that faith. You think of Abraham. Paul wrote of Abraham in the book of Romans. He staggered not at the promises of God in unbelief. What a statement, men and women, that is. It reveals that Abraham, whom we describe as the father of the faith, father of the faithful, Abraham was a man of great faith. But how do we know he was a man of great faith? Well, the answer is because God put him to the test. And God, God recorded the details of that test in the scriptures for us to read and to learn from. In Hebrews chapter 11, remember it's the great faith chapter of the Bible, it is recorded of Abraham that by faith, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. So the Lord tried his servant the Lord tried his faith. Remember, it's written in the context of faith there in Hebrews chapter 11. And the Lord tested Abraham's faith uh, severely. And brethren and sisters, maybe that's what the Lord is doing in your life at this time. The trials that you're passing through, they have a divine purpose. They are testing your faith, testing the sincerity, the reality of that faith and testing the strength of it as well. I ask you, how do you strengthen your faith? How can that faith be made stronger? That should be our desire as the Lord's people. Well, the answer is by prayer. You think of the disciples. They came with a simple cry to the Lord, Increase our faith. Just think of that, just four words. Lord, increase our faith. Now that prayer is a lesson in brevity, in prayer at the throne of grace. Sometimes we imagine that we have to pray for a long time to get an answer. And let me I just caution a little and say there's times to be before the Lord in prayer persistently until the answer comes. But just a simple cry, just a short petition like that offered by 
the apostles increase our faith. Take that upon your heart today. I encourage you to pray that prayer as well. Pray it at home, privately. Pray it in the prayer meetings. The great need of your passing through trial. That's certainly one place you need to be regularly and faithfully. Need to be in the prayer meetings of the church. Can I close with this thought? You look at the words in the middle of verse 6. Though now for a season. There's great comfort in those words. The lesson is that your trials will end. Your trials will come to a close. They are not permanent. They will not last forever. They are just for a season. Just for a set time. Young people passing through exams at this time of the year, some expecting exams in the new year. Every exam or test has a set time. And so it is with God's tests, God's trials as well. He has promised, brethren and sisters, that he will not suffer us to be tempted above that that we are able. In other words, he won't keep you in the trial. He won't keep you in the fire one moment longer than is necessary. He will only keep you there as long as is for your good, your spiritual good, and for his glory. So the trials and troubles of life, they're to be expected, brethren and sisters. They are essential. Sometimes they can be extreme, but God has an end, God has a purpose. God has a desired result in all of those uh, trials and troubles. The trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless his word today at every heart. Two verses, please, 4 to 6. Does Jesus care when my heart is pained? Too deeply for mirth or song, as the burdens press and the cares distress, and the days grow weary and uh, long. The first two verses only plays a 4 2 6, and we'll stand as we sing. Father, we thank you for the good word of God to our hearts today. Pray that you'll speak on to us. Our prayer, Father, is lead us on with thyself. We pray that you'll increase our faith. Rid us, Father, of that self-confidence, that dependence in the flesh. Help us, Father, to lean more 
upon thee day by day. We ask thee to burn up all the dross. You know the way that we take when you've tried us. You'll bring us forth as gold. You'll bring us forth as pure gold. And Lord, we want to be found unto the praise and glory and honor at that day when our Savior appears and we stand before him. So we ask thee, Father, that you'll deepen our walk with thee, that will mature more day by day. We ask thee, Father, to apply to all of our hearts uh, the great truths that we have considered today uh, from your word. The scriptures speak about the fellowship of his sufferings, and we're conscious, Father, of all that the sufferings that we will experience in this world. And we pray that his grace, his peace, will be multiplied today unto all of your people that are gathered here. Part us, we ask in thy fear, with thy favor. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, be our abiding portion, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.